This is about defending democracy. This is no longer Democrats versus Republicans. What do you want your kids to believe in? There must be give and take. This is White Flag with Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh here, governmentauction.com. It's a live auction site where you bid against other people interested in land, jewelry, coins, all kinds of collectibles, even Rolex watches. Have you ever wanted a 40 acre plot of land in Texas or Wyoming? Governmentauction.com has it. If you're the winning bidder, you don't need to go through credit checks. You just make a few down payments, keep your monthly payments going for a few years, and the land is yours. While you're making payments, you can use the land just like you would if you owned it. I know I've always wanted a big piece of land where I could go and just hang out, hunt, or hang with my dogs. And it's easy to sign up and start bidding on something that catches your eye. Go to governmentauction.com. It takes less than five minutes. Governmentauction.com. White flag with Joe Walsh. Uh, I'm really excited about who I'm speaking with today. A friend of mine, somebody who I really uh, appreciate a whole hell of a lot, Tom Nichols. I'll get to him in a second. Um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Doesn't cost you a damn thing. White flag with Joe Walsh. Listen to this podcast wherever you listen to podcast, Spotify, Apple. Tom Nichols, uh, um, uh, staff writer at The Atlantic, longtime professor, professor emeritus of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. I think Tom taught there for 25 years. An expert on international security, nuclear weapons, Russia, securing democracy, all of that. Got a great book out there right now called Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy. Tom, thanks, my friend, for joining me. Cool, Joe. Good to be with you, man. I didn't want to just sit around and hold your hand and you and I do what Never Trumpers tend to always do, right? And we live in this world where you it sucks. Everybody on the left <laughs> talks and bitches about Trump, and everybody on the MAGA right does their thing. And Never Trumpers have their little club. Uh, I don't want to do that. I want to pick your brain and 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 focus on something really, really specific. Uh, as context, you and I are allies because we are both Never Trumpers, and we're on the same defending democracy side. Uh, we came at it uh, much different paths to get here. Um, I want to focus Tom Nichols on how we should view people who still support Donald Trump. And I, I want to jumpstart the convo, my friend. When people found out I was going to talk to you, I got a, a number of emails. And I got an email from a buddy, a friend, who, and I want to read it to you, Tom Nichols, because he does compliment the hell out of you, but then he takes a, a not so subtle jab. Uh, and, and the final thing I'll say, Tom, before I, I quickly read this email is I, I say this with affection, um, but some criticism. I, I, I consider you to be in the elite class. Um, we can talk about that. I come from the, the, the MAGA base, the populist mud. Uh, now we're on the same side. Here's the, here's the email I got from a friend. Joe, I'm glad you're having Tom Nichols on. I'm a big fan of his, but I'm disappointed. Here it comes. In what I consider to be his superficial assessment of what ails the American people and politics. In a nutshell, Tom blames the public for the feeling of entitlement and their lack of seriousness. And when he does that, Joe, he fails to consider three things. I'll, I'll fly through these, then we'll come back. First, the lurch toward white nationalism and authoritarianism isn't just a U.S. thing. We see it in most countries around the world. This suggests something much bigger is at work here. Second, uh, Nichols isn't considering the empirical fact that acceleration in income disparity leads to social upheaval. His take is to just be disdainful of their economic insecurity when there is some MAGA outrage being committed. Lastly, he hasn't addressed the intellectual or cognitive disparities in groups that are causing all the political division. We can clearly see in the data how Trumpism 
is highly correlated with a lack of college education. Here's why I think this is important. And he, he ends, Tom, with another compliment toward you. We need people like Nichols, deep thinkers and intellectuals, experts, to help us crack the code on what is causing all this craziness we see day in and day out. What is causing otherwise good people to just mindlessly support someone as deeply flawed as Donald Trump? Joe, you and he now have the floor. G give me, start broadly with me first. What, what's your reaction to a critique like that, Tom Well, it's, I, I, I get that. Um, you know, as the saying goes, I get that a lot. Um, but I, I'm going to I'm going to do something very elitist and say I knew it. I, I read I, I wrote a book about this. So I'm going <laughs> to tell the guy, you know, well, you have to read my book. But let me let me explain the background of what I wrote. Yeah. And I hope it clears it up because I didn't just write a book basically saying, oh, you know, Trumpers suck the end. And and some publisher just throws it out there. Right. And we're going to make a million dollars. Um, the book I wrote was actually about the global struggle for democracy, yeah. um, and it was for university press. And, and this matters, right, because it wasn't just a partisan thing. I had to go to Oxford University Press. They had peer reviewers, anonymous peer reviewers who hit me with comments and, you know, suggested things I had to look at, including the economic stuff, yeah. like in prosperity. So um, I, 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 in fact, I, oops, <clears throat> I actually, excuse me one second. I actually took this really seriously um, because I took about two years to write this book, yeah. and for about four months I was completely blocked because I, what your your friend who wrote you the email, I took that argument very seriously, yeah. and I tried to prove it. Like like good scholars take the hardest case against them and see if they can make that case. Right. The problem with that whole argument that it's not just. Um, you know, it's not just it's about income disparity and globalization and unequal levels of education is that the there's no the data isn't there. It's very it's very comforting as an explanation, because I think you think that if it's just an income and educate, you know, just better policies can fix this. What I found um, was not he, by the way, your correspondent is absolutely right. This is a global phenomenon. Yeah. But what he's missing is that it's a global middle class phenomenon hmm. that and and that it doesn't always take the form of white. So in America, the white supremacy angle is very much an American angle in, you know, Britain or Poland. It's um, anti-Muslim. Uh, it, Poland, different, by the way, different, correct? It, 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 pardon? Different, different. I mean, anti-Muslim. Yeah. I mean, there's some overlap there. Anti-Muslim white supremacy, but different. Yeah, it, France and Britain have a lot of Muslims. In Poland, there's a very strong anti-Muslim movement, which is really kind of is going to prove my point in a moment because there aren't that many Muslims in Poland. Yeah. It's purely kind of manufactured. Um, in Italy, it's um, you know it's a it's it's a middle class phenomenon that was driven. In fact, the the Italian populist movement was driven by uh, like a venture capital rich guy who got a comedian to start a social movement. Yeah. Um, so he, he's right, but the the thing that links all of these in the UK, in Italy, in Poland, in Turkey, everywhere else, is that the the movement against democracy is not a poor people's movement. It's a middle class movement. It's a and this is a problem that uh, going all the way back to you know Eric Hoffer and yeah. kind of drawing Nietzsche and Francis Fukuyama. It's, it's a problem that a lot of people saw coming. What happens when an affluent Middle class with high living standards and a, you know international peace basically gets bored out of its skull, and this is why your your letter writer I think is just so mad at me because it's like no no it's it's about economics and globalization and um sorry uh, it's about it's about globalization and all that it's not I mean it, it is in a way in the sense of um, people in the middle class in these countries saying, I'm not respected enough. I'm not, you know, given my due, I'm successful. And yet I'm not part of the cultural. Do they, Tom, do they feel, I agree. It's a middle-class movement. Does the middle-class here feel like economically they're doing well enough? They don't, they never do. They never like, do. Back, as, I, as I said in my, in the book, you go back to 1970, right? The supposed golden age for all this stuff. 
And you have people saying, I voted for Nixon because nobody listens to the working class and the working man's getting screwed and nobody cares about us. And nobody, it, it's it, it, Bruce Springsteen. I talk about Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> the How many times is Bruce Springsteen going to write the same song about the same town losing the same factories? By my count, he's written. Yeah. He's, he's written it in the 1970s, he wrote it again in the 80s, and then again in the 2010s. How many times does that guy's town have to die? So it's part of it. It's been going on a well, long while, but it's part of it. Here, here's what's, I, I think here's what's going on. Um, first of all, the poorest are not the prime movers against democracy, which no. I think is something surprising, right? I mean, if, demo, if this were about poverty and globalization kind of screwing people, you know, Fukuyama had a great observation about this a few years back. He said, if that were really the case, you would expect that all these populist movements would be leftist movements. Yeah. Right? They'd yeah. be kind of socialist, redistributionist. They'd be, you know, justice for the working people. They're not. These are all these are all in here in the United States, heavily racially based, infused with nostalgia. One thing common to yeah. all of yeah. these movements is incredible nostalgia. Um, you know, Britain, you know, I, if only we still had swinging London, you know, um, but the other thing you, you brought up in your, your letter writer brings up is education, but again, it's education as a divide in the culture rather than in any kind of economic sense so that you, you can have a guy and I, this is kind of the example I always use that a guy who makes a million dollars running a pizza joint, right? I, a lot of my Friends and family ran pizza. We're, yeah. we're Greek. We ran pizza. You know? <laughs> um, but, you know, they did really well yeah. and they're very well off. And yet a lot of people in that job could say, why is this, you know, graduate student making um, starvation wages? Why is he more elite than I am? Because we've moved to a knowledge based economy. Right. Um, and a knowledge based culture. Um, and so, you know, I'm so, I, 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 f I don't want to push back dismissively on your writer. But I spent a couple of years trying, kind of trying to prove his case. Do you, Tom? Do you? We have one thing, Joe. Yeah. The, the thing that, and I was, I, I said, you know, I was kind of blocked on writing this thing, <laughs> and that actually helped because the final draft in the manuscript, I was literally about to like hit send in. Wait for it, January 2021. Oh wow! And, wow! And ja January 6th proved beyond a doubt that if you look at the people who went to January 6th. These weren't out of work steel workers. These were realtors chartering jets. These were people that could afford all this. I mean, you know how expensive all this in this ridiculous tactical gear is. These are people that could stay at the Willard. Um, well, wait, 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 wait. But wait a minute, Thomas. It, I, it, and hit me over the head if you disagree. I think the vast majority of people who broke into that capital that day were working class, I say this lovingly, stiffs. Working, no. I mean, working class, middle class. There's actually um, a guy named Bob Pape at the University of Chicago did, a, did an analysis of all these people who were arrested. And the, that um, not just the convictions, but like everybody that was there that they could find records on. And very few of them were unemployed. Very few of them were young. Um, no, I agree with that. They were middle were, class. They were middle class. Yeah. The, they weren't the, working class stiffs, Joe. They weren't like... The, you know, I lost my job, at, you know, in Youngstown when the steel factory closed. So I'm here to throw a, a, a fire extinguisher. It, it just. No, like but Tom, said, do you think. Not there. Do you think when I say working class stiffs, again, I mean that affectionately because that was my base. To me, working class stiffs are ju just another way to, to, to describe the middle class. That no, is the I, middle class. Sorry, a, chiropr a chiropractor, a former FBI agent, former cops realtors that's not the, I, I don't know what kind of middle class you came from oh that's middle tom but but you look not every not working steps that's a middle class you know reasonably now what's interesting about some of them is that there were people who'd had money problems mm -hmm. um you know or other professional issues but that to me just strengthens the argument that this was kind of a resentful why not me movement instead of people saying you know I've worked hard I've played by the rules I did everything I could um, which is how it was it was presented. That's there's just no evidence that that was be, that's what that movement was you about. Don't, it's about now. You Tom, you don't you you wouldn't say that uh, January six was a, a preponderance of wealthy people, correct? No, no but no, 
No, oh no. I think it's. I, mean, I think you. This is semantics. I mean, I'm. Th- semantics. I'm talking- you said I say ordinary middle class. You say working class stiffs. I think there's a difference between working class stiffs. And again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Tom, I'm thinking yeah. guys who make 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120,000 dollars a year. To me, guys who work hard and they, they're, to me, that's middle class working class. OK, they, it, then we are having a semantic difference because I don't think it was guys that were saying, how, you know, I lost my job at the factory. How am I going to, you know, to Chinese manufacturing? How am I going to feed my kids? Well, I agree that, with that. That, it, that, I, that was the myth. Of this whole thing. Yeah. And it was the myth in Brexit. It was the myth, um, you know, in, in parts of Western Europe. It's the myth in places like Turkey. Um, but it, it's simply not not the truth. I agree with that. It, 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 it wasn't it's not a movement of wealthy people. It's certainly not low income people. It's call it what you want. People in the middle or upper middle. It's people right there. It, it, um, Tom, you're in this, and I, I look. I, I tend to think this is more cultural. There's more going on than just uh, the, the, the economics. You talk about nostalgia. It's what I have heard from these people every fucking day of the year for the last six to seven years, wanting something that was back there. Do you? And I know you know that too, and you you you've mentioned it as well. Like that's, and you got to grow up, you got to move on. Life's changing. The country's getting less white every year. Come on, get with it. But nostalgia is not all bad, is it? This kind of nostalgia is poisonous. Explain. Well, because, you know, uh, Joe, you, in fact, I'm going to turn my camera to say, I mean, I'm a pretty nostalgic guy. You know, I've got all these posters and I've got all this dumb stuff in my, yeah. you know, home. Um, you know, I, I, I have lots of um, 60s kitsch in here. That's, look, remembering your childhood fondly, even those of us that didn't have particularly nice childhoods, yeah. that's, that's part of human memory, right? Um, what this kind of nostalgia that says, I was better off in 1970. Well, first of all, the, the people that are saying that they weren't, um, they weren't right. I mean, it's you simply were not. Um, so there's something else it, going on. It, it's a way of saying, and I'll give an example of how that nostalgia played out. And I, I've used this example in a lot of discussions I've had with people, but I had a friend that I grew up with yeah. um, from the time I was like seven. And he was like, he, he did really well in life. He didn't go to college, but he was working class guy who actually, you know, broke into kind of like, sales and stuff like that did well owned a house had a boat all that stuff and and he just shook his head and he said you know you just don't understand things have to change and i said he said you know when we were kids things were better and i'm like you just don't like that the barber shop is a spanish church now he's like no i don't and i you know i was like at least you're being honest but here's where it becomes even more poisonous one of my other friends same neighborhood he pointed across the street, and I talk about this in the book. He pointed across the street because I, where I grew up was off factories and smokestacks. Yeah. Like literally looked out my my window at a smokestack. And he said, when we were kids, these factories, remember when they were full? And I said, dude, they weren't full. We broke the windows in that factory. We vandalized this place together. It wasn't full then. You're yeah. not – you remember – you are literally at that point remembering something that didn't happen. And it started to freak me out talking to people when they'd say, but remember this? And it's like, no, I don't remember that because it didn't happen. And that kind of nostalgia in the book, I I quote this, um, this one scholar calls it restorative nostalgia. Like, why is my life? Why does, why am I dissatisfied with my life now? Um, Because somebody's screwing me over. And the way I know that is how good my life was 30 years ago. That's just a way of rationalizing what you're going through now. Um, And I think people do that when they don't want to take, and this is where I'm going to get your, your letter writer mad at me again, Joe. This is when people don't want to take responsibility for their own decisions and their own agency in life. Um, And and that's, you're right. My letter writer believes, and you and I've talked about this. You're, you're rightly critical of these people. Are you, and I think he believes and at times, I wonder if you're unduly, overly harsh on them. And I would say, the, your your friend and the people I've argued with this, 
are patronizing to them, treating them as if they have no human agency. Um, you know, he said, I, I wrote this down while you were talking, he yeah. said, you know, otherwise good people. And I'm like, you know, if you're supporting Donald Trump in 2023, can you make an argument that you are otherwise a good person? Answer that. Answer that. I, I don't personally, I don't, I think that that's a moral failing. To me, that's like saying, you know, I'm, a, I'm an otherwise good person, but I supported David Duke for governor. I, I can't I can't fight you on that because that's been my that's been my hill for the last I mean, five years. Right. You know, David, there were people say, look, you know, um, I'm good to my family. I take care of my kids. I, I you know, feed my dog. Um, I just happen to think David Duke's what this state needs. And millions of people voted for him. One of my friends, he said, well, you can't call those people racist. Well, maybe. But I think I think at this point, I you and I, you know, because you and I talked about this yeah, years ago. Yeah. I didn't say that about people in 2016. Right. I understood that for a lot of people in 2016, they said, oh, man, you know, I got to pick between Hillary Clinton and this TV show guy who might not be. I voted for Trump. (laughs) I know. You know, I'll I I get and I get it. You know, the people said maybe he'll change or maybe it's all an act. And we don't really know. The problem is by 2023, you know everything. And the people who say, well, I don't, you know. There was um, there was a um, an interview with Jordan Klepper, who I think is just hilarious. The guy who goes yeah. to these MAGA rallies and talks to these people, and he said, "You know what would change your mind about Trump being guilty?" He said, "What if he tried to stop people from testifying?" She said, "Oh yeah, that that would show me. Yeah, he'd probably." He said, "Well, he's doing he's that." Doing that. <laughs> and he said there was this long pause, and the woman he was talking to said, "I don't care." Okay, 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 but stop. Mr. Nichols. Uh, And again, this goes to that balance. Yes, they need agency over their lives. Yes, they are responsible for their lives. Yes, if you still support Trump at this point, that's on you. But but and maybe, Tom, I'm I'm at fault because these are my people and I come from that world. So do I, Joe. I know. Well, hold on. But no, 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 no. You do. Vis-a-vis your background, I'm saying I come from the MAGA cult. I was oh, I, in the I, MAGA I understand, cult. I understand. And and I'm trying to balance, and I agree generally with you, and I fought my letter writer on this a little bit because I defended you to him. But then I balance that with all the fucking shit these people are fed 24 hours a day by Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and all of these Republican politicians. And I know they're responsible for themselves, Tom. But it's not all them, is it? Well, let me ask you something, Joe. Let's you and I be the old conservatives we were before 2016. Yeah. Let's be the, you know, you and I, we probably would have butted heads about a few things, party, on yeah. a few things, right? But we'd have basically locked arm and said, you know, personal responsibility, et cetera. If someone weighs 300 pounds and has diabetes because they've been eating at Burger King every day, would you have blamed Burger King? No. And I've had, I, I, yeah, I, I um, you know, fo- what, one of the things I think we learned from the Fox deposit, from the Dominion yeah. depositions, Fox is, now there's a synergy there, right? I mean, there's no doubt a give and take. It's the pusher and the addict together. But Fox clearly said, we, we, will, we will lose business unless we shovel this shit out the front door, because that's what they want. And if we don't give it to them, I said this in a tweet the other day, they want the blue meth. And if we don't give them the blue meth, they're going to go find Walter White somewhere and get it. And I think at some point you have to ask, why? Why is it that people are basically saying, you better tell me the craziest shit you can think of, or I'm going to tra- change the channel. Okay, okay. You, 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 see, you're, you're putting me, I'm putting myself in a shitty spot because I'm going to go back to, <laughs> and this is why I always love engaging with you. I'm going to go back to your Burger King analogy. Yes, I primarily blame that 300 pound guy for eating a Burger King, but I do believe that that guy needed help and needs help and is beyond the point of being able to get help and right. and he needs help to get out of that Burger King world. I think so many of these people went so far down the Fox News hole, they're not they're no longer capable of getting themselves out. Okay, but again, I just want to I want to play old school conservative for a minute. I mean, think about how much 
like liberals were sounding right now, Joe. No, no, that's new school liberalism, what I just said. That's, I You know, agree. like, remember when we were conservatives and people would say, you know, you white conservatives, you don't <laughs> understand the problems of the black inner city. Yeah. That, that they have problems with drug addiction because they feel hopeless because economic opportunity has passed them by because infrastructure, you know, is built around them rather than through them. You can take all of those. Those are the exact same arguments that MAGA apologists now say, well, you know, people in Ohio, they're addicted to opioids because, well, you know, it's not their fault and infrastructure and jobs. I, well, there's I truth, th Tom. I think we were somewhat more heartless than we had to be about the problems of the inner city. Yes. But let's, but let's not go all the other way around now and say that we are going to be as patronizing and as coddling as liberals were in 1974. You know, to um, people, I mean, because I feel like that dehumanizes people. It takes away their sense of agency and their human responsibility. But I agree with you about Fox. Again, this is kind of like a drug discussion, right? It that, is. It is. You know, the and, the, and the, you know, it's like, is it a supply problem or is it a demand problem? And it's a little of both. But I think. Um, so what, you know, if, the, Tom, what if they're addicts? And, and you and I would say, if, if you want to go down this comparison, if they are addicts, these folks, they need help. It, it's yes, it, ultimately they're responsible for their decisions. But well, and sometimes the way you deal with that is tough love, and to say, agreed. I am not going to keep. Uh, my answer to this has always been, and you and I have had this discussion about how to engage on these things. To say, you know what? If you're going to sit here and tell me that, you know. You, you're going to talk about the Biden crime family and Killary and Venezuelan voting machines and space lasers and all that shit. I'm just not having this convert. I don't I'm not going to argue with you and make you feel bad, but I have every right to, to pull back and say, I'm not having this conversation with you. And my my goal is going to be to outvote you so that you can't bring Agreed. all of that toxic sludge into the government. Agreed. Um, uh, and, uh, so beyond uh, that, I'm not sure what else to do, because as a as a you know, free speech absolutist. I'm not going to try and shut down Fox. No. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and, um, you know, censor. I mean, as Fox, I think Fox is one of the most destructive forces in modern Amen. Uh, democratic history. Amen. Amen. But you have the right to be wrong. You have the right, right to stand in the public square and, you know, blather your propaganda. But it's, you know, we, we used to be more resistant to this. Because we we took politics more seriously. The idea that Tucker Carlson had the biggest audience in evening television, for anybody that ever followed Tucker Carlson's career, it's it's almost right. You're laughing, know, right? Because yeah. you remember Tucker Carlson. Yeah. I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely inane. But he figured out how to push the poison. How to push the poison. He was also, he was also watching the ratings needles. Yeah. Oh, going, you know, kind of going up and down and saying, okay, this is what they want. This is what I'll give them. And I think, I, I, no, I hey, think Tom, you're, look, you're right, my friend. It's just because we come from different places, we've talked about this. It's, it's part of my job to reach in and talk to these people every week. Uh, I, I do. Why? Let me challenge you on that, Joe. Why? Why? At some point, when do you say, no, you don't have the right to engage me every week. No, I, I say. I mean, I understand you do it as a matter of you know the the show and what you, kind of the people you're trying to reach. But but when do you finally reach a point where you say, you know, again, I take, as if they were David Duke voters, right? I mean, people are going to say, oh, it's not fair. You're comparing Duke to Trump. I think that's no, perfectly that's completely fair. Now. Completely. Um, fair. To say, you know, if, is it is it your job every week to say my job every week is I'm going to talk to David Duke voters and see if I can you know lead them toward the light. Um, and I think at some point, you know me, I'm I'm kind of an old school <laughs> moralist about this, you know, about some at some point, you, you know, shunning and shaming, which used to be a thing in American Agreed. politics. That, that, that that, used to be a thing. Well, you're right. And the left spent years trying to get rid of shunning and shaming. And now the right's doing the same. I agree That's, with you, Tom, you and I just come from different places. And I agree with you. The end game is we just have to fucking beat them. But well, it's funny you say that, Joe, uh, because just before I came on with you, I was talking to my wife and I said we were talking about Clarence Thomas yeah. and the, the left <laughs> sort of you know defenselessness in the face of this incredible amount of yeah. let us let us be kind and say this incredible amount of the appearance of impropriety, and um, and I said you know the 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 book to be written one day. We've had a 
ton of autopsies on the sins of the right, and we deserve it. You have gone out there and said, man, culpa, I yeah. caused this. I was part of it. I'm going to own it. But I also think the kind of the fecklessness yeah. of the left and the, and the notion that, again, you know, can't be judgmental. There are no guardrails, et cetera. You know, we, we, we collectively kind of left our – here, I'll just make – just to make people on the left mad, uh, <laughs> it's not a never Trump or love fest. Um, you know, when I, when people have asked me where I think the first guardrails really fell that made Trump possible, of course, people on the left say Reagan, you know, oh, entertainer. Yes. And I say, you know, I'm like that. No, the first guardrails fell when Bill Clinton was elected. Yeah. And the, and the answer there was character doesn't matter as long as you're getting what you want. And and then when Clinton stood on the you know South Lawn and they did the celebration of beating you know it's like as long as you win you you know you can spike the football no matter how horrible it is to me that was the beginning uh, of the twenty five years that helped to lead us um, to where we were. With that said, let me just before people on the left start yelling at me. I would- if I had my choice between Bill Clinton and Donald Trump yeah. right now, I'd I'd be carrying a Clinton Agreed. sign. <laughs> I mean, I voted for Hillary Clinton, unlike you. I I, I bit that bullet he, and and, he, and voted for Clinton and and wrote telling other people to do likewise. You, so. uh, Thomas, you asked me why. Why do I still engage these people? The answer is simple: because I'm I'm able to move a few out of the ignorant cult. Only a few on a regular basis. Uh, my son, my 34-year-old son is an alcoholic, uh, thir- uh, five, six years clean. You talked about tough love. You're right. Ultimately, it's tough love. And I got to a point with him and his drinking where I had to say, fuck you, son. You're out on the streets. You're on your own. That's the only thing that saved him. I stop with these people individually when I when I get to that point and I can't do anything. But I'm, I'm able, but, but Tom, I just, it's this notion that, and I'm with you. But I, 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 I think of them as addicts who need help. Uh, Man, that's going to make some of them so mad. I know. That you just put it that way. I know. I know. I think of them as grown men and women making terrible choices that they can have and should own. Um, because I don't think that the poison they're getting from Fox is is really strong enough. And it's strong stuff. Remember, part of my strong. duty... You know, when you, you have a feel you have a duty to engage, I, I watch Fox sometimes for three or four hours at a time yeah. as a social scientist, right? To say, I want to know what other people are watching. And yeah, by about 11 o'clock, I'm like, you know, you know, this country's a whorehouse. Um, yeah. You know, they're, yeah. this is a, it's a nightmare. Um, but, but Tom, doesn't that make you just a tad more yes. empathetic toward the, yes. these folks? A- absolutely. But the right answer to that is, Turn the goddamn thing off. Right. But again, I I know that. But again, if. if, And don't change. Excuse me. Don't change it to MSNBC or CNN. Watch a a freaking movie. Put on Gunsmoke, for Christ's sake. You You know, I'm I'm big on vintage TV. Turn on Mannix. Get away. Unplug your brain out of that crack machine. Um, And people don't want to do it because I think they're personally so invested and this is, you know, the word we haven't gotten to, but the word I used in my book huh. that your correspondent's going to hate is narcissism. This is this is the channel Fox, especially, is the channel that just says you're right, you were screwed over, nothing is your fault, you know, the world is against you. It's very seductive, but it's also something that, you know, I think competent adults should be able to say, should be able to turn, you know, kind of like. Hey, listen, Burger King makes its food, and I don't want to pick on Burger King, McDonald's, Burger yeah. King, whoever it is, they make their food to taste good so that you, the minute you're done with those onion rings, you go, you know what I really want? I want another onion ring. Right. It's like somebody, one of the great uh, comments about crack that I remember from the 80s is that someone said, I do a hit of crack and I feel like a new man. And the first thing that new man wants is another hit of crack. Um, yes. At some point you have to say, okay, but I, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't go walk in there every single day. And I, I don't want to lose that, Joe. I don't want to lose that sense of some agency because I think respecting other people as my fellow, as uh, other Americans, as my fellow citizens capable of making real choices is the greatest respect I can pay them. And simply saying, look, you're just addicted and you're, it's not your fault and you don't really understand what you're doing. 
Um, I think that's that almost fills me with hopelessness to get to that well, point. But, but, but is it, Tom? I mean, I agree. Ultimately, you want to get to that agency, but but there's nothing wrong with giving them some help along the way. I think these are people who have not had help. An alcoholic, a drug addict, you're going to acknowledge that an alcoholic needs help. Ultimately, he or she. Well, you're, the you're the intervention. You're the guy who says, wait a minute, something terrible. I've been where you are, yeah. and something terrible is going on here. Because um, they don't, I, Tom, they don't get it anywhere else. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there's um, there's such a hostility involved. Let, one thing I was thinking about, with, uh, when I, because you sent me the text of that fellow's, you know, qu quotes from that fellow's letter. He's a, thought, big, he's a big fan of yours, by the way. I, I, and by the way, whoever you are, I really appreciate you, man. Um, you know, I don't, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind well-intentioned criticism. I take a lot. Um, but there's a, there's a real weird asymmetry here that says um, these people feel looked down upon. They right? do. I mean, they do. They feel very, but they effortlessly look down on other people and don't think twice about it. And I've tried to have that discussion. I, I've tried to do what you've done. And I've said, I, I, this is a, again, it's a true story that's in the book. Yeah. Um, where I was at a, and this was not, you know, MAGA world. This was with a very right wing kind of academic colleague, which is pretty rare yeah. in academia, right? Yeah. And he said to me, he was looking at me over the dinner table and he said, your contempt for the voters is palpable. And I said, and I looked right back at him and I said, as is yours. I said, we just have contempt for two different groups of voters. And, and I said, why is... Why is you? I said, how do you feel about people in, you know, New York City voting for Hillary Clinton? And the fall, uh, you can guess what the fallback policy was that he covered it with well, abortion. Yeah. I said, OK, so you're what you're saying is your moral contempt is well grounded and fair. My moral contempt is just mean. <laughs> and he was like, well, you know, that's a, and I was like, well, you know, I, I don't know how to get to that point where you say, look. We disagree, and but I'm not going to treat you like a child. I'm, you know, yeah, I do look down on a lot of what you believe in, as you do with me. The question is, can we be fellow citizens and go and vote without, you know, having to throw support to a violent, seditionist sociopath? Um, you know, it's, it's it's interesting how many people think that I really want Trump to be the nominee. Oh my God! Be, yeah, for me. You know, you and I were yeah. talking about this the other day. It's like, oh, you guys want Trump to be the nominee. Hey, I I just want a normal president, uh, the closest thing we can get to a normal presidential election without, again, without this raging psychopath or sociopath. I can't I don't know if he's a psych psychopath. I think it's safe to say he's a sociopath. Yes. Um, you know, but but I, I, I mean, I can't really have that conversation with people who say, yeah, but. You know, um, but Joe Biden and pronouns. And I'm like, OK, I, I don't know where to go from that conversation. So do you, Tom, then if you take your attitude to its extension. Do you believe any of us? Do you believe any of us can or should do anything to try to convert some of these folks? Or is the bottom line at this point just fucking beat them? Just beat them. You know, it's such a good question, Joe, because my, my gut at this point is like, just, you know, save the wear and tear on your own psyche and soul. Just go and, you know, be, but, you know, when we were trying to, and this is going to seem like a trivial huh. comparison, but when we were trying to stamp out smoking, now I'm a, I don't know about you, I'm a former smoker. Never. Okay. Uh, I was a, hey, in my 20s and 30s, I was like a two pack a day Whoa. guy. So, hey, I, you know. Um, there's a reason I'm fat now and, um, um, yeah, right. And my, my, vibe, when I was talking about, by the way, none of you can't see me from the waist down, but you people, when I'm talking about, you know, going to Burger King, I have, believe me, I feel your pain because I'm a heavy guy. Um, and by the way, Tom, I'm going to interject now because I, yeah. I know many people know this about you, but everybody needs to know this about you. You were not born on third base. You were not born with a silver spoon. You, I, I wasn't born in the neighborhood of the ballpark. You, 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 you have working class roots. I was the unexpected, um, the unexpected child of a 43 year old man who was having a 
torrid romance with a woman much younger than he was. And, yeah. you know, my parents yeah. were married and six months later yeah. along yeah. I came and it was a pretty difficult, yeah. you know, working yeah. class upbringing from there. Um, but to go back to this, to this issue of how much can we engage, you know, with smoking at some point we stopped saying, no, look, smoking's bad for you. Yeah. And it causes hypertension. You just say, listen, if you're going to smoke that, go outside. Okay. Right? Okay. Then, and Tom, I love that. Work, right? We stigmatized. We took it out of TV. We took it out of movies. We took the advertising off the air. And we, but we also said, hey, you don't smoke. Like when we were kids, Joe, could you imagine telling somebody to go outside? And my house was filled with ashtrays. Oh, completely. Yeah. People came over. Everybody. Yeah. Freaking smoke, yeah. man. Today, you come to somebody's house, they say, you know, they plot a pack. Of, if you even know people are going to plot a pack of cigarettes and say, hey, I have a deck. You can go have your cigarette yeah. after dinner. And we just kind of made it. I mean, I, I, I've i often said I would like to make supporting Donald Trump something like smoking in church or in a kindergarten or something. Yeah, that's, Tom, that's actually a great, ana- that's a great analogy. And I guess I'd respond by... We're still new in this. I mean, we're only six to seven years in this thing. It took a while with smoking to get to that point. I just don't think we're there yet to say, fuck you. If you're going to support Donald Trump, I want you outside in the backyard. People do it, right? They, a lot of people have told me this with their parents who are, you know, older people especially are totally addled by Fox. And younger people have said, Dad, I love you. Yeah. And I want to hang out with you. And I want to have a beer with you, you know, whatever. But I'm not, if you're going to start going on about this, I, I can't be here. So we've got to talk about something else. And I think that's actually, I think that's much more effective than argumentation. Let me just be a social yes. scientist again for a moment, because we know from studies where we've tried this with people about other issues, arguing with people will actually deepen their conviction yeah. in the thing they believe. Yeah. They think that arguing with them, and I'm going to say something now that's more insulting than your addiction um, analogy. <laughs> there are people going to get mad at you, so I got to take some of the heat. I think that a lot of this that we're seeing in American public life is the is an out, outgrowth not only of narcissism but of loneliness, where people say this shit and say, "Now, now, give me emotional energy. Engage with me for two hours. Let's just yell at each other." Because you know, like, I mean, anybody who's ever been in a bad marriage knows that um, sometimes the only way you express emotion to each other is to fight. Right, um, right. But, you know, that that it's almost like, look, just, get, you know, give me some of your precious attention here um, and, and validate me. And I think, you know, the, a really effective counter to that is to say, I love you. I want to be around your dad or mom or whoever it is. Uncle Ned, I always talk about Uncle Ned, you know, pass the potato. Uncle Ned, I love you. Thanks. <laughs> pass the potatoes. I'm not having a discussion with you about, you know, Venezuelan voting machines. The, uh, just not- the, uh, I, love, I love the shit you say. The, the, yeah. uh, the, the context, Tom Nichols, to all of this, though, is... And that's why I think we're still new in this. These people, my base, my peeps, they have been fucking ignored for years. No, by, they by, 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 by the elites, by the Republican Party establishment. They, Tom, they've been crying about you build a wall on the fucking border for 20 years. And the, the, the establishment Republicans ignored them and laughed at them. What a gigantic load of horseshit, Joe. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And I mean that with love you you in a life-affirming way. <laughs> Look, to some extent, you're right. You know, my my colleague David Frum yeah. once said a very, in a very, I think, chilling expression, because he was absolutely right. He said, listen, demagogues don't arise from fake problems. They arise from real problems that the establishment won't deal with. And immigration... I mean, I'm a I'm an immigration hawk. I mean, I am I am probably as right wing as as all uh, you know most people in the Republican Party are, and I'm the grandson of immigrants. Yeah. But the reason I'm yelling bullshit here is because when given the chance, what so many of the Republican voters have done, like when Trump was in office, they say this is about immigration. This is about income inequality. This is about the rich getting richer. It's about the little guy getting screwed. And then they have no interest in those policies as long as they get, you know, uh, Trump being completely offensive all the time. Yeah. Trump's going to build the wall. 
nobody really, you know, no, 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 what they, she- wanted to see, they wanted to see that family separation policy because, again, one of my Atlanta yeah. colleagues, right line, Adam Serber, the cruelty is the point. They just wanted to well, see. I, I know that, Tom, I agree with that, but they also wanted to see the fucking wall. They did. And yet, and yet Joe, the people that were hardest over on that were people who live in places like New Hampshire and Iowa. I mean, it's it it was it, and and then when they voted, if when they came out of the voting booths and they were asked, what was the biggest thing you voted on? Immigration fell right down that ladder, even among Republican voters, and it, which proved to me that it was just a way of a kind of a a primal yawp about brown people. I think. But well, let me, yeah. let me bring up one other issue here about the the income and the left behind globalization. Yeah. They say, well, the you know the Republican elites don't listen to us. You keep voting them in, and they keep putting through policies that screw you. And as long as they're dancing around and you know waving around all this white supremacist claptrap on Fox, you you're not noticing. I I did my taxes. You know, it's April last month. I just did my taxes. Trump's tax changes benefited me. Yeah. They didn't benefit the guy who's a wage earner or, or maybe right. a small right. business owner who makes a lot of money. They, they, there is this, I mean, this all goes all the way back to, to what's the matter with Kansas, right? Right. Like, the people in Kansas keep voting for the people that screw them over. Um, but at some point when it happens year after year, after year, after year, you have to say, you know what? I can't take your concerns seriously because you don't insist that your elected officials take them seriously. I mean, Trump, right? Conservatives were all about make government smaller, drown it in a bathtub, well, limit the power of government. Trump came in yeah, and said, yeah. I want to be king and rule by executive order. I want to build you know, a wall by taking money from the Defense Department. I hate the military. I hate the FBI. I love the Russians. And all of a sudden, conservatives went, you know what? As long as you're pissing off Tom Nichols and Joe Walsh, good. I don't care what you're doing. Look, it, t- Thomas, you're, you're right. Look, I got I got fucked, and I, I should have been more less blind to this, but the whole Tea Party thing that I was proudly a part of, to me, was all about balancing budgets and limiting government and lo and behold. I was behold, wondering if you were going to bring that well, up. No, no and, but you're right. Lo and behold, and this just stab- well, about that. This stabs me in the fucking heart. Most people at the end of the day in that movement didn't care about that shit. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this again because, you know, you and I were we moved this this evening and I, I you asked me to do this a while back. And I was thinking about what we talk about. The Tea Party is the first place I started to feel myself really peeling away, you know, Why? from Why? the Republic. Because it was and, I, and, I, and I'm going to bring this up again about immigration yeah. and abortion because it was. It was there was a meanness to it that had nothing to do with policy. It was just people saying, "I I think it was about people saying I'm freaked out by a black president. I'm fl- freaked out by demographic change. I'm freaked out by you know the fact that I made bad decisions during the big housing. You know, I'm I'm one of those old school, you know, um, either." Very sober analysts or huge jerk uh, who says, you know what, we had a housing crisis because people bought houses they couldn't afford. Right. That's why. Right. Um, you know, and they and they took stupid terms on things because they were literally gambling with arms and mortgages. Um, but the Tea Party, so many folks in the Tea Party, when I first said, you know, this turned into kind of a big racist carnival, they some of the founders of it, guys that you would know, got really mad at me. And they said, I got into it because of TARP. Yeah. Um, because of bailouts, yeah. because of taxes, and I believe you. I take I take seriously. I, I kind of backed off on that because I wasn't there at the birth of the Tea Party. It wasn't my thing. I take seriously that there were good conservatives who said I really care about you know government bailing out banks that went to the big you know Wall Street gambling parlor. Um, but it turned into a freak show. So and and when the Republicans couldn't divorce themselves from that freak show. That's the first time I thought maybe I'm not a Republican, and I literally deregistered for a little while. Was the 2012 primary? Well, so that's uh, Tom. That's, that's so that's so fascinating. And the history probably is you probably despised my politics back then. But to, and you and I could spend five hours talking about the Tea Party. I'm going to write the book as someone who comes from that movement. You're half right. I've always thought there were two strands to the movement. One strand was this limited government bailout, get rid of, we're, we're, we're bankrupting future generations. 
And then the other strand was the ugly cultural nationalist shit. And Tom, gonna, like, when, Tom gonna... when we went to D.C. and we didn't fucking deliver at all on the economic shit, then the cultural took over. They, but they didn't care. I mean, most they were going didn't. Down, most didn't. You know, but they were out there. Um, the, you know, when the Tea Party guys showed up with Confederate flags, that's when I started going, you know, I don't think this is about TARP. Yeah, um, but that you was, and I, yeah. back in those days, I would have hated your politics because I was a squishy, you were you know, a rhino. Eastern mod con you were- <laughs> and you know, those Midwestern hard right, you know. Um, but I, I think, you know, again, we, we would still have agreed on some basic yes. things like the government has to function. The Constitution has to apply to everybody. Um, hey, um, and- let's, let's close this. Let me ask you a couple questions as we close. Um, sure. Uh, we're brothers now. We got here from different places. We're brothers. We generally agree. It's so funny. You make me seem like a lib because you are definitely <laughs> more hard ass than me. And I love that about you. And maybe that's Tom because I'm a recovering tea party MAGA addict, but I really appreciate that about you. Um, is it lost? Is that well, former party of ours lost. done? The, the Republican Party's gone. Done. Done. And I didn't want to, I can remember being in some of the first meetings of kind of groups of never Trumpers, you know, where we literally would ask the question, should we still be Republicans? Should we stay in the party? Because we just said, well, the party's always going to be there. You know, how much should we, but that, those seem quaint. Yeah. Those discussions seem quaint yeah. now. It's like, wow. Um, so I, I think that the Republican, unless and this is partly why I am a hard ass. Unless the Republicans are deprived of electoral oxygen right down to dog catcher, and then somehow somebody just kind of picks up the brand. But I, I think that, you know, the party of Lincoln has really, you know, I, I just don't know if it's survive, if it can survive this. I think there will always be a center right movement because okay. that's the nature of politics. Yeah. I mean, I, I have fun. I am in a, I think of myself as being in a pro-democracy coalition. Yeah. I have significant disagreements with people on the left about the size of government, the proper role of government. I have disagreements with my friends on the right, like you, about, you know, what, about populism and Guns economic and probably programs. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, uh, it, it, but as long as we are all operating under the same respect and reverence for the Constitution of the United States... I, I, I can get along with anybody. The problem is that we're facing a movement. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're recording this on a day where another four guys just got convicted of seditious conspiracy. Consp- I mean, I, think about that. Fifteen American citizens have been convicted of seditious con- conspiracy. conspiracy. Blows my mind yeah. that anything and and these are you know the kinds of people they are. Again, are these were these you know noble unemployed iron workers? You know, no, they were creeps. And, you know, the people that are defending them, I go back to, is this really, is this something you feel right about? Is that a, is that a moral position you want to take? Um, I think the, the big, I, I don't know that I'm more hard-ass than you are, um, but I think, you know, years of being a federal employee, yeah, um, you know, where I had to, where my, you know, vow, had, took my oath to the Constitution, like people in the military and other civil servants would, um, just kind of made me, a le- but I, maybe that's also my personality. I'm just a little it's, more black and white. I'm a little more. Absolute. You're a fucking curmudgeon, and I want you to, <laughs> I want you to soak in it for the rest of your life because that's what you are. Yeah. Love it. You yeah. know, I want to say you're wrong, Joe, but you're right. So yeah, <laughs> I guess I- no, I don't know, and I don't know truthfully if you're more hard ass. I think the difference between you and I is. For better or for worse, I come from their MAGA world. I just, I feel like it's just part of what I have to do. Um, I, I, I get that. I all. just, I, I want to respect them enough not to treat them the way we treated drug addicts in the 1970s. I want to be able to say to my fellow citizens, you are capable of being better than Do this. they? Okay. If, I'm, I'm not going to let this go. So I'll ask you one more quickie. You don't want to treat them as drug addicts or alcoholics. Do they do do should we give them some help? I, I don't know what that help looks okay. like other than to treat them as 
you know, when people say, well, you're looking down on me or you're being mean to me. No, I'm treating you as an equal. I'm, I'm, you know, um, yeah. It, you know, I'm treating you the way I would treat somebody who's, who I think is fully in command of their senses instead of when you say, well, you know, Donald Trump is the greatest president ever. I, 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 I think treating um, the, the insulting thing would be for me to say, you know, that's an interesting point. We should discuss that. I'm like, no, we're both grownups. I'm going to disagree with you. I think you're making a terrible choice. Um, I've, I've, and I've done this, by the way. You know, I wrote a lot about expertise yeah. and knowledge. When people say, I think the world is flat. You know, teachers are taught. We're taught to say, um, that's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Let's discuss my argument all along now has been to say, no, the world isn't flat. You probably know it isn't. This is one thing I think we should say to people in MAGA world. You're wrong. And somewhere deep inside, you know, you, you know it. Yeah, but you I don't know. think, Thomas, you don't lead with that. So when, when I sit down with a MAGA person, I spend most of my initial time trying to understand why they think the election was stolen. And, and, and like, where does that come from? And how'd you grow up? And what makes you think that? I, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a root causes <laughs> argument. That's, you know, that's such a liberal argument, Joe. I'm a liberal. A I'm a- <laughs> you've turned, oh my God, you've turned into a leftist. Oh my God, um, Tom well, that's a, well, let me, you know, it's like if somebody oh, said to me, well, Lord. I just, I think the world is flat. Well, where'd you go to school? And what was your family like? You start by saying, look, we can have a lot of discussions about a lot of things, but we're going to start from the world isn't flat. We have to start there. We can't spend all day in that rabbit hole. And I, I, you That's know, interesting. I, 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 you have more patient. You, of course you were a politician. Yeah. You have this. I, I, um, you know, I never had to do that. And so, you know, it's just not a skill set. Two, I was a teacher. You were a teacher. A I know. That's a different skill set. Hey, I mean, two, two final quickies. Um, first one is I've been asked by a number of people to consider in these years becoming a Democrat. I'm sure you've thought about it or had people approach you. Have you ever thought about becoming a Democrat? Nope. Why? Um, one is, uh, you know, it's funny. Somebody asked me this just the other day, like two days ago. And I said, you know, I was Republican for up like 35 years. It was like, I was married once I was in love. <laughs> I, I, my heart got broken um, I'm all about dating, um, but not about remarrying. Um, but I think there's a bigger problem, which is that I think in the in the modern Democratic Party, the biggest movement in America right now is unregistered voters. Yes. It's unaffiliated, not unregistered, un, unaffiliated. Yes. Um, so I consider myself part of the biggest political movement in America. Um, but I also don't feel like I'd be welcome in the Democratic Party. I mean, the, I why I why? get Joe Biden. I really like him. Yeah. Um, but he's 80 years old. Yeah. He's kind of, I get yeah. him. Yeah. Remember, I worked in the Senate when Joe Biden was there. Right. Um, you know, I kind of get that generation of politician. Um, I don't have the same kind of social justice interests or I shouldn't say that not the same interest. I don't have that, that vocabulary. I don't right. have that same syntax. And I don't want to have par- intra-party arguments about should the Democrats be more like this about social issues or more like that about, I'm like, look, I just want us to, to have a functioning democracy under the Constitution. The rest is, in a way, Joe, I, I'm, I'm 62. I'm not that old. But I do feel like with a lot of major problems, I want to turn that over to younger people yeah. and say, well, what Joe Walsh and I want is for the Constitution to still be in effect. 30 years from now when we're in the ground or we're gumming our jello at the so, home. So, 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 Nichols, you segued perfectly into my final question. We are 92, you and I, uh, and we're gumming our way in that old folks home. You've still got your facilities. And try to give me a short answer, but what does politically this country look like in 30 fucking years? I, I don't know. You know, remember, I was a Sovietologist. Yeah. So that's like when people said, hey, in 1985, what do you think the Soviet Union is going to look like in 2015? <laughs> and anybody who answered that question is desperately trying to dodge it now. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, in 30 years, it looks more diverse. It looks less white. Um, that's something we know is going to happen no matter what anybody does, no matter what Donald no matter Trump, what. Republicans or anybody does. Um, I'm hoping that 30 years from now, we look back at this period and say, man, that was just a bad time and a close shave. 
and that we're back to arguing about that, you know, somewhere down the line, we started arguing again about should marginal tax rates be 36% or 38%. Um, but I, that's, that's my hope. I don't know if we're going to, we're going to get to that. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Radio Free Tom. Um, read his stuff in The Atlantic. It's wonderful. Uh, get his book. Uh, if you're interested in anything he brought up today, uh, Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy. He's one of my favorite people. Tom Nichols, thank you, my friend. Thanks, Joe. Thank you for listening. Remember to listen, share, and follow White Flag with Joe Walsh on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere great podcasts are found. And be sure to leave a five-star review. This has been White Flag with Joe Walsh.